Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Welcome to our Lincoln University SOLA seminar series. Today we have a special topic and um, our guest is Gail Sauter Brown. Uh, she is a, a author and consultant um, and she will today talk to us about landscape design and health, the role of the designer in public health. Um, please, for those who would like to ask questions, we have the Q&A uh, box at the top left corner of your screen where you can ask questions during or after Gail's presentation and we will address them at the end of the presentation. I will leave the floor to you, Gail. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Nada. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, the, the topic landscape design and, and health is one dear to my heart because it's um, what I've just uh, conducted a PhD uh, um, exploring the, the, the effects of design, of landscape design on health outcomes. And so this opening slide um, it gives you a, a um, an idea of what we're going to talk about. This is in an urban landscape. This is a public space, an urban landscape. And uh, research participants, um, three out of 164 described it as uh, messier than they expected. Um, but most people found it utterly delightful. And they were intrigued because some people had never seen long grass before. And others like this research participant just relaxed into the space. So we're going to talk about how we create health. And what it means to create health from a design perspective. Um, and so what I want to do is to. Reflect. On research and practice, so I have been a. a a salutogenic um, design practitioner, so designing purposefully to effect health outcomes for somewhere between 25 and 30 years. And I was motivated to do a PhD to take my, my usual um, passionate um, engagement with the topic generally and put an objective lens on that. But sometimes I, I slip back into the passion. So um, that's my background. So as a practitioner, but now as an academic researcher as well. And so with that, through that, um, I'm able to advise um, all sorts of um, projects and work globally. So very briefly, I uh, set up a practice Greenstone Design in the UK in 2006. Um, and then launched in New Zealand in 2012. And so we have been working around the topics of landscape design and health for some time. The images that I've chosen in this presentation um, have all been chosen for a reason. Uh, and, and this one, um, the sheep out the front, heading in an uphill direction, but there are followers. So. Uh, just hold that, that image in your head there as we go through. So urban landscapes are where most of us live and work. And internationally, globally, uh, more people are going to be living um, in urban centres than in rural areas for the first time in humanity's history um, in the next decade. New Zealand is already far and away are more organised than most places. We're sitting at about 87%, I think it was last at last count. So these urban landscapes shape who we are, how we live, and ultimately our health outcomes. And our, our landscapes that we're exposed to are variously like the image there on the left. And so they are flat grass spaces, closely mown uh, with some trees. Um, and paths through, or they are like the image on the right, the plaza experience, which is predominantly over 60% paved, and it's got fixed seating and trees and, and architectural uh, straight rows. There's a lot of 
uh, man-made materials in the plaza and although it, it's got the the greenery there it's a, a very well in fact they both are very managed um, landscapes so what i was interested to unpack was what impact did these landscapes have on on well-being so as sensory garden designers so um, my design practice has focused on sensory gardens um, for many years because sensory gardens are wellness gardens and what they aim to do is to integrate to activate and integrate the senses in a way that neither of the, the, the landscapes and the images there um, do and so why um, basically because I was interested in stress as stress impacts well-being so lifestyle related diseases such as some cancers heart disease depression anxiety obesity they are all linked with stress and we know there's a wealth of evidence around design which is able to reduce stress or add to it and so if we um zip backwards here slightly um these are the landscapes we're exposed to. These are both designed landscapes. And if we can add stress or we can reduce it, here's our opportunity to use design to actually reduce stress, which will then impact those lifestyle related diseases. Why? Because I'm interested in thriving, the concept of thriving. So, which is beyond well being to, to actually love life so to be able to thrive in the city urban health takes a different way of looking at things so this then becomes an invocation to low cost high impact initiatives for a healthy health creating society and this is something that lord nigel crisp the ex um, chief exec of the national health service in the uk has just written a book about uh, published last month called health happens at home hospitals are for repairs and it's all about a healthy health creating society and so we're going to unpack um, how we have a health creating society but more as we go through so what we know is that environmental design can significantly reduce stress now the audience um, for this webinar is likely to be quite mixed so we're talking about statistical significance here we're talking about social significance also but when we're trying to affect public health outcomes people in the the medical profession work with numbers it's not enough for anecdotal evidence to say that this new drug's going to work and so my research was an objective randomized controlled trial of vitamin n um, being for nature to say how how does that design work and we found that it does significantly reduce stress so um, if we go back to the original slide there with the green space that the flat manicured lawns with the trees generally speaking um, the literature tells us that we will achieve about a five percent um, reduction effect in salivary um, cortisol the stress hormone in a space like this one um, the image that we've got here this biodiverse space very flexible adaptable space where you can pack up and move seats to be with people away from people in the sun and the shade we've got an almost 20 percent effect size so environmental design can significantly reduce stress we also know that environmental design can be protective through my research this randomized controlled trial i had one group intervention group spent time in that plaza that we saw in the first slide and other groups spent time in the sensory garden that I designed as an outdoor laboratory. And then we had a formal control group. So we could see what everyday like life was like, you know, walking the dog, going to the beach, um, that carrying on as usual. So those people were um, constant in terms of their salivary um, cortisol levels. Their chronic stress levels stayed the same over time. People in the plaza, their salivary so stress cortisol levels dropped about six percent and the people here in the sensory garden uh, their chronic stress levels dropped 
as I said, almost 20%. But this protective element was the interesting bit, whereby we also measured um, using validated scales, perceived well-being. So the DINA scale of perceived well-being was looking at, sorry, not DINA, um, scale of positive and negative effect. So what we did with the well-being measurement was to say, how did you feel at baseline? And then they had 30 minutes once a week for four weeks in these various environments, either the, the plaza or here in the garden. And then how did they feel afterwards across this, this range of measures? And for a very few people, their cortisol levels had gone up. So cortisol is a um, test the moment in time. And so had they had a, a stressful morning before they came into the lab for their cortisol testing, those people who had been in the sensory garden, their well-being had gone up. So even though uh, the cortisol measured that they were more stressed than they had been at the start of the study, their well-being had gone up. So they felt great, even though physiologically they were more stressed. People who had been in the plaza, the very few whose um, cortisol had gone up over time, their well-being effect plummeted as for those whose cortisol had had that almost 6% drop. So they felt really bad about life having been in the plaza. So across all measures we tested their productivity and their nature relatedness as well, there were trends towards a negative effect of the plaza, which was probably the biggest surprise of the study and a positive effect a significant positive effect across well-being, salivary cortisol, and productivity after time in the sensory garden. We also found that healthy active lifestyles occur naturally after time in this health-creating landscape, this healthy landscape, this biodiverse space with an emphasis on healthy ecology prompted people to spontaneously get out and exercise more. People reported that they drank less alcohol, that they took themselves off long-term depressants, that they were able to problem solve, that the social connection, relationships all improved. So we know that social connection is important for well-being. We know that nature connection is also important. And what we found was that by giving people access to this space in their workplace at the university. So um, the participants were staff and students at AUT. They naturally wanted to seek out that healthy lifestyle, that healthy active lifestyle. So fascinating. So perceptions and reality are a big part of how we design and who we design for. As designers, we respond to the client's request for a particular environment. And clients will often perceive problems along the way. And they may have had a bad experience somewhere or they may have heard something. And so those perceptions become their reality. So I believe we as the design professionals have a responsibility to gently guide those perceptions. So we have that responsibility to show that the environment can be manipulated to promote that healthy, health-creating society. It's got to be accessible and not just ramps and handrails accessible, but from a mental health point of view, what is it that creates a space that somebody who's feeling vulnerable feels safe in? And it's having places where they can retreat, but look out, that, that sense of prospect, that sense of being away that sense of refuge. So that's all part of the accessibility part of design. Low cost. Now, um, it's not that we particularly work to a, a low budget, but the L's part of the reality. Um, and I was trying to find words that work. But that this sort of an intervention doesn't cost the earth. But it has a high impact. So it's not an expensive way of looking at things. It's no more expensive than what people are doing already. And in the case of this um, sensory garden versus the plaza space, 
In fact, it was around 10 times cheaper, uh, less expensive. So uh, for the same 900 square meter space to, to um, develop. So it's impactful, we know that. We've got the data. Um, trust is a big part of it. And so to build that sense of trust with clients, with communities, with people that you are co-designing with, is vital. If you're going to try and alter anybody's perception, you've got to build those relationships to start with. And this is all about young and old, able and differently abled. And that was something really nice in terms of research outcomes was that the effect was universal right across the demographic. So regardless of culture, where design is often culturally specific, we found that universal effect. Um, we had 51 different cultural backgrounds in terms of research participants, and there was um, no difference um, perceived across effect. So trust is something that deserves its own slide um, because it is so important. And with trust, we then have the confidence to test ideas. And that's something that we found as a practice and also as a researcher, as a scientist, we've got to have the freedom to say, this may not work, but let's try it. Let's create this as a, a trial, as a pilot, and then if it works, we can roll out more. And that's exactly what we're going to do now with the work that we've done. And so with that, we've got a responsibility to report what we've done. But as a scientist, you know that even no result, if it doesn't work, that's a result in and of itself. We've got to understand where this knowledge can be applied in the community. And I have to say it's pretty much anywhere. In fact, I haven't come up with um, a sector, a location where you wouldn't want to consciously design in health and well-being from the get go, whether it's part of an urban densification program or whether it's post COVID saying, what are we going to do to create that healthy society so that when the next pandemic comes down the line, we've built up that community resilience, that extra immunity, not necessarily to COVID-19, but to all the stressors that are likely to come our way. So it's a social contract with, with the people that we're working with, with society. And it, it's treating all those individuals with dignity. So if we treat the people as the taonga, and the land, the whenua, again, as a taonga, then with that, we can trust ourselves and the people that we're working with to create that desired outcome. And this is all about outcomes. So, evidence-based design. Um, it's an interesting thing. And it, when I was um, doing my, my oral um, examination, my viva for my PhD. It was a question that was asked by one of my examiners who happened to be uh, the head of School of Architecture at Cornell University. And we had a discussion around how can we effectively, objectively evaluate our work and all the work of others. And we agreed that it's very difficult, which is why I conducted this randomized control trial. So yes, we've got instruments like post-occupancy evaluations, but they tend to be quite subjective, very subjective often, with closed questions. Do you like this? Rather than what is it that works for you? Where are the, the, uh, the issues? But then those questions, if we're asking on a post-occupancy sort of basis, if the people that we're asking the questions of haven't experienced anything different, they don't know the potential. So that goes back to that trust and responsibility that we educate the people that we are working with from the get go. So what is evidence? Is some anecdotal reports that this works enough? Do you have to go to academic journals that have been peer reviewed to find empirical studies that have been rigorously assessed as offering a new way of looking at things, <clears throat> excuse me, or a review of the old. So how do we use 
evidence? Where is it best applied? And I'll leave those questions just to, to sit with you and we can discuss those maybe some more at the end. So when we integrate the determinants of health, the determinants of health, the social determinants of health, we've got people like Bront from Brenner taking that sociological approach, looking at layers of influence and environments that's on the outside. And the medical model Engels looks at the biopsychosocial model of health which again is looking at influences, but nobody really is looking at the quality of the designed environment. And that's where this integrated salutogenic design for health and wellbeing comes in. So we can do something as simple as, okay, here's our oak barrel here, um, the old wine barrel with some goldfish, water lilies and some reeds. So we can take a salutogenic design approach. We can bring life literally into spaces, whether it's social housing as here, or into a workplace, into a school, into a business park, into a shopping center. We can design in health and well-being very simply by bringing in life. So we're not talking the plaza, which is fairly lifeless. We talk and we're not talking the flat grass landscape closely mown with a few trees. We're talking bringing in that sense of life and living and dynamism, whereby we've got visiting dragonflies or bees or the fish moving. So this is what integrated salutogenic design can do. So the role of the designer, back to our plaza, we've got evidence-based links between design planning principles and health outcomes. So historically, planners had a really strong role to play in public health. And as health has become medicalized, um, I was reading something this morning, I'll just find it here, uh, that said, imagine if a team of scientists divined a drug which massively reduced people's chances of developing cancer or heart disease cutting their overall, overall likelihood of dying by 40%. This would be front page news worldwide and Nobel Prize at good as in the post. That drug is albeit ready here, albeit administered in a slightly different way. It's called cycling to work. Now, if you can cut the overall likelihood of dying by as much as 40 disease, 40%, through cycling to something as simple as cycling to work. Um, yes, there are all sorts of complexities around that. But we can extrapolate that out to say the designer has an opportunity, and I would say a moral responsibility, to be able to affect those health outcomes through how we choose to interpret a client's brief, how we choose to advise when we're going to developers, advise when we're going to councils, advise when we're going to DHBs to say, this is what we can do with you. This is what we can do for you. This is what we can do through you. So when we think in terms of outcomes based design, these are our opportunities. So the role of the designer is quite significant, I would say. So healthy or unhealthy. And so this was the plaza that is so like so many examples of public space um, around Otatahi, down by the Avon River. We've got loads of concrete based seats, um, flat. Uh, it's almost brutalist architecture in so many ways. And yes, there are reasons around that. Um, but if we go back to the perceptions of what's fashionable, what's functional, and then layer on top of that likely health outcomes, we may want to change our approach. So natural and built environments play a key role in shaping health outcomes. So previously, uh, that lack of causal evidence was used to justify the status quo. There was no proof, therefore we're not going to change doing anything that we've been doing. But we now have the data and with that, the responsibility to act. So this um, image is in a workplace. 
and so it's not your average workplace, um, as you can see. It is a very lush, slightly wild, very biodiverse space, which becomes that oasis in the heart of that everyday work environment. So workplace well-being was designed in with wildflowers on the mound, with planting that is fragrant, that attracts the birds, that attracts the bees, that attracts the other pollinators, with edibles. So it becomes an edible landscape. So sensory rich in any other way. So our solution in terms of creating the climate to allow people to thrive is to reduce stress by connecting people with people. And we know that. We know that social connection is important and there's a lot of work gone into that. But less work has gone into connecting people with nature. A lot of work has gone into the digitised experience and that's around the perception that it's too hard or it's too expensive or there's too much maintenance involved and having the real deal. So there was a hospital, um, excuse me, that we worked with uh, in London that was looking to pipe in a biochemical uh, produced of cut grass and herbs through the air conditioning system. And we went in and said, actually, um, it's a whole heap cheaper to just put a, a, a green roof on the hospital uh, roof um, by the air intakes for the air conditioning system with real herbs. And uh, the, there are no chemical side effects. The, the, there's, there's no manufacturing involved. It's a lower carbon footprint all round. So connecting people to nature, um, nobody gets rich from. And so because you don't have to manufacture it, it's a curious sort of a thing that people want to spend money on something that's been manufactured rather than use what's here. And when we use what's here, nature, when we revere nature for all the potential, that green infrastructure, that health infrastructure, those ecosystem services, however we want to describe them, then we're giving the respect back to that urban ecology that supports us. And we could uh, go down another track, which says that it also mitigates climate change. So what we're doing when we address human health and wellbeing by taking an ecological approach, because I firmly believe that without ecological health, there can be no human health and wellbeing, is joining the dots. It is integrating salutogenic design into our health promotion framework to create that new paradigm shift that says we can create, we can design health creating societies. So the vision then is to explore physical and social space, those social determinants of health. We want to look at those differently. So we want to put our focus on environmental quality. And as we do that, we will then, by default, create that healthy, health creating society. So this image here is actually in Paris. Um, and Mayor, the Mayor of Paris, Anne Hildago, absolutely understands the health promoting capacity and potential of green space, of nature connection. And she was aware that there wasn't enough of it available in and around the city of Paris. And so this is on um, the old Périphérique, the uh, ring road around the city down by the river. And so this is uh, on top of asphalt. And so we've got movable planters uh, inexpensive timbers and arrange such that you've got a sense of enclosure. There are places to hide away. There are places of refuge, places of retreat. There are edibles. So you are allowed to pick a strawberry on your way to work. You are allowed to harvest the greens as they come ready for eating. The fruit off the trees. 
It's about that investment in the people and the place. And so that unlocking the potential of people in place takes that different that different lens. So to explore those social determinants differently. Beat stress move more was what we did as a design solution. Um, we took my research project and entered it into a, a, um, a global competition for healthy, active spaces. So the design became the solution. So what was it that was stopping people from exercising? And the hypothesis was that it was stress. And so by reducing the stress, we found that people exercise more, as simple as that. And so the healthy ecology was key. Now, it's one thing to say healthy ecology of key, but there's a whole practical level of the estate management that has to support that. And so whether it's a museum estate, whether it's a hospital estate or a university estate, a business park estate, those estate managers or, or the parks and reserves, parks and um, sports grounds, managers, all those people need to be brought on board early on to understand what we're trying to achieve and the way to go about it. So we save money by leaving the grass long. We only have to mow a path through it, which uses less fuel until we get electric mowers in widespread use across New Zealand. We've got electric um, maintenance tools in use in some boroughs in the UK, but they're not widespread. So what we need to do is look at operating costs. We need to look at the capital costs. And that's been one of our, our issues is that where the costs are incurred, those capital costs are in a different cost centre to where the benefits accrue. So the ideal is somewhere like a care home environment where the developer is in fact um, the, the funder of the intervention and sees the benefit. Likewise with a, uh, a healthcare provider. So that the management support that buy-in right from the get-go, right from that first idea is vital because if we're leaving the grass long, that can be quite challenging for a lot of people. And in fact, with the research garden, that, that was an actual challenge um, to say, no, no, the rest of the estate you can mow, but in here, this is a special space. This is our, our secret garden uh, that does things differently, but has a measurable effect, was the, the, the bottom line answer to this. Co-creation is what it's all about. But co-design is so much more than stakeholder engagement. And we hear about co-creation and co-design a lot. And I get a little cynical at times where we've got to be able to really bring people alongside. Where we're not just the experts in our ivory tower, but they're with people hearing them and their concerns and their day-to-day -day lived experience and designing in the problems of the naysayers. And I've found over many years that it's the naysayers who will give you often the greatest insights. Uh, the example for that was uh, we were designing a, a playground in Moscow in Russia and uh, in the US International School there. And so we had a workshop and, and most of the, the staff and a lot of the parents were involved and it was all marvellous. And I went round after the workshop and sought out teachers who hadn't been at the workshop in their classrooms to say, um, excuse me, you didn't turn up. Can you talk me through um, any issues that you may have? And there was one lady who said, what a waste of time a playground is doesn't get light till 11 o'clock in the morning. What are you doing wasting your time out there? We need more books in the library. And even though I was coming from a relatively um, high latitude uh, from London, I hadn't fully appreciated the reduction in daylight hours 
had completely slipped my mind. And so what we did was <clears throat> we turned the negative into a positive and we put fairy lights in the trees. And in fact, we placed trees to become like light lampposts um, throughout this playground. And it became a magical fairy wonderland uh, for the children during the winter months. And the most extravagant natural playground uh, during the, the brief summer months. So that that was the naysayer that created the best possible outcome um, for the children, for the staff, for their families who use the space. So bringing everyone along ensures that sustainable results, sustainable in terms of it being enduring. And in this co-creation, we've also got to recognise that no one individual holds all the sum of all the knowledge. We can't possibly. So when we've got questions, call in an expert. Don't be ashamed ever to say, I don't know, to put up your hand and say, take that phone a friend option. So calling in the experts. Uh, I've had the privilege of, of doing a lot um, over the years with the most remarkable people and people are really, I've found, willing to share their knowledge because that is the aim once you have knowledge to be able to then do good with that knowledge to, to share it. So um, yeah, I just threw that out there. So solutogenic urban design, if we're designing to promote health and well-being, wildlife corridors become corridors for people also. Um, and when I was looking for an image for this slide, um, I couldn't find the one that I wanted of the, the, the bike path through the trees, but this gives you the idea of it's a linking route along the outside edge of a space, could be anywhere, that is good for the wildlife. What this is not showing is that there's shade there for the, the pedestrians, shade there for the cyclists, say shade there for whoever else might be navigating the space. So we need to be thinking of those sorts of things, not total shade, but seasonal shade, to make it an attracting, attractive space for wildlife then makes it an attractive space for people also. Built and natural environments connect. It, it's just a given. And we have started to reconnect those spaces. And so indoor outdoor flow has become a thing. Um, but often it's tokenistic. Schools we find still that the door to outside is far away from the classrooms. Hospitals, now that we've moved away from the TB wards, very little opportunities for patients to get outside, for staff to be able to get outside to that health promoting environment, just to duck out, take five minutes. So it may be that for a lot of people, they don't get a chance even, if you're in an operating theater doing a nine hour operation, you don't get a chance to duck out for five minutes, you don't even have a chance for a cup of tea. However, if we can create a route along the car park, from the car park into the hospital building, that is supportive, that does all those health promoting things that we've been talking about, we then create an opportunity to charge up the individuals as they go through the door even if it is only a five minute walk each way. So charge up at the start of the day, recharge at the end of the day. So we need to be thinking in terms of connecting these spaces, how we connect them and what with. And it's gotta be soft landscaping. So in creating, engaging, enabling spaces, we have an opportunity. Um, the image on the left here is um, from Berlin. And we're doing a lot of work um, around the world in terms of uh, designing rain gardens uh, and that's part of that green infrastructure. It's a wonderful thing. But it doesn't do much by way of health promotion. Other than to move stormwater away that would flood a space that that might cause um, stress or, or if left, it, it could be um, effective for disease. But it's not bringing life to the city. Now, here in Berlin, what they've done with their, their road verge, instead of putting in rain gardens, what they've done is that they've got the same um, engineering approach in terms of the, the rainwater being able to drain into this space, 
but they have given permission to the people living in the apartment above this area to claim the space as their own. So the street tree was there. Everything else, including the picket fence, was put in by the apartment dweller upstairs. And there's a little seat in there. And they've got this diverse planting and they've got strawberries and they've got cherry tomatoes happening and they've got various flowering perennials. And it becomes a little oasis in the city again. The photo on the right um, was a scheme that we worked on in a, uh, a social housing development where you can just see, um, can you see my mouse pointer here, the galvanized steel downpipe, well not downpipe, um, was holding up the veranda rather, and there's a downpipe around the back behind it, and it was grey and it was ugly and it was totally utilitarian and so many of these spaces end up looking utilitarian. And again, we, we've got some of the most vulnerable people living in them and they've been given utilitarian design. So for very little money, what we did was we retrospectively added the trellis framing, put in the raised planter around the base, popped in some spring bulbs and grew a fragrant vine. And it's now the space where this little darling comes out every morning to water her babies, her baby plants. And so from a public health point of view, we have designed in health and well-being so simply into the space. So we started talking um, about urban environments, but that first slide of the sheep uh, heading uphill was obviously rural. And when I was um, with the, who was it with? Uh, Global Challenges Summit in Kazakhstan. Um, I met with women from UN Women. And in my ignorance, I hadn't realized that there was a group um, from the United Nations dedicated to women and women's health, women's economic outcomes um, internationally. And we got talking about rural women and rural health and rural environments and what we can do for people in rural communities. And it goes back again to that sense of what's good for the animals, what's good for the wildlife, what's good for the plants is good for people and vice versa. So those things, the healthy soil, the water, the trees, the shelter, the cover are as important in rural environments. So if we have the opportunity to effect any change rurally, we've got an equal responsibility to bring life back in. And so the massive monocultures that we see across so many industrialized agricultural countries, some might say is a necessary evil to get the economic advantages. I would counter and say, we've got to have trees. Western Australia did particularly well by making sure that they had trees at the edges of fields, which then brought native insects, that then brought native birds. And so you had an ecosystem which then naturally measured, um, managed the pests in the crop. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that naturally nature balances things out. And when we try and overcomplicate things by simplifying it, by paving it over, we destroy all those natural balances. So if we go back to the basics to healthy soil, water, trees, shelter, cover, whether in an urban environment or a rural environment, then we can create those health outcomes that we're seeking. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Gail, for this very inspirational um, talk. We can definitely tell that uh, your entire speech comes from the heart. Um, until we get some questions in, I have a quick question for you. Sure. Um, so um, throughout your presentation, um, you 
you know, the main focus on well-being, which is today in landscape architecture and in a lot of uh, similar dis disciplines, it's really becoming the heart of um, uh, of our thinking and our planning and how should we approach spaces and create places that promote well-being. Uh, there's always the question of management that sort of comes to the surface sooner or later and uh, what better is to have public spaces that promote well-being because it, in, in creating public spaces means they're accessible for everyone. Um, so um, uh, my question is we look at lawn from a perspective that okay lawn should be mowed and you know everyone takes the responsibility the city goes and mows the lawn on public property and um, it's acceptable but in, in, in your pictures on the AUT campus like let 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 the grass grow and and feel inspired by this uh, a fresh meadow like because it, it takes you outside your 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 everyday life outside your own boundaries and it can take you somewhere somewhere else and which is I think part of the process of promoting being and um, you talked about the, the example in, in Paris and how there are strawberries and fruits and people can on their way to work or going home, they can just pick up, you know, a fruit and eat it. And there's nothing more beautiful than having accessible um, fresh fruits or, or veggies available to you on public on the public street. But the question of management is it, it, that comes um, in, in, in my head right now. OK, why are we in, from a perception a point of view? Why are we so easily accepting of we need to mow the lawn every week or every other week, but uh, maintaining fruit trees is always a problem and uh, we always find more hurdles and find it more challenging to uh, to have, you know, fruit trees in the city uh, to promote well-being um, at all scales for all people of all um, of all social standings. Um, did this come across your research at any point? Absolutely. Uh, it, it's a big issue everywhere, but we really address that um, with the research. And what we found was it was the coherence and having a sense of coherence is vital to well-being, uh, vital to um, stress reduction and being able to logically understand the landscape. And so for some people who have never experienced long grass, long grass, fruit trees that drop, it's messy. Mm. And when your life is feeling out of control, when you know sort of your workspace is, is mad or your family relationships are a bit off the wall we want that really ordered structured life and what we've found that's fascinating is that we do a lot of work um design work with special needs populations so uh, people on the autistic spectrum for example require a very ordered predictable environment and what we've seen over time is that with the digital overload of our Western culture is that mainstream design has now trended towards what we historically have provided for people on the autistic spectrum, which is fascinating in and of itself, and that's worthy of, of some more research. But in so saying, we also know that if we can interpret the environment and let people know that it's safe within five minutes it doesn't take long they can just go oh. and you can see that body language just change completely there was one young man um came into the research garden and he was stiff with stress and he marched around and he explored and i was sitting over in the corner and um he marched up to the base of a tree and he turned around and he said are you allowed to try climb the tree i said yes of course and so he went and he climbed up the tree and he got as high as he possibly could and he sat down and he turned to face me and he said i've never climbed a tree before and i said wow well look at where you are now mm -hmm. and this guy was in his late 20s and we then had the conversation that He'd never really been outside much. 
He'd been a pressure cooker child going to after school activities and, and doing well and music and organized sport and all sorts of things. He'd never done simple things like climb trees. And he came in and he was not sure what he was doing or where he was, but he felt this urge to climb it. It was just fascinating to, to observe this behavior. And then we had other people who would come in and say, oh, I didn't think I could make um, my session today. And then they would just, you'd just see the stress drop off them. And so back to this management of the space, we had a real, it was difficult. And um, in terms of the conversations that we were having with the estates managers at the university, because they had worked in a certain way forever. And we've got the international precedent that estates management is, is done like this, in this way with flat mown grass, because it's what people expect. And we hadn't fully appreciated the, the concerns that would be there around that. And so initially, um, we had a couple of instances where they, they came in with glyphosate and sprayed the seedling um, wildflowers twice, in fact. So they had to be re because there were weeds coming up. Um, and they mowed on a weekend. It was like, oh no, we've got to wait for the stuff to grow again. Mm. But having then had brought them in to experience the space themselves, to say, just sit down here a moment. And so these were the, the estate workers who were used to mowing and trimming and spraying and doing all those clippings and things. They relaxed and they went, wow, this nice. is really different. And so it's very difficult, I think, to imagine sometimes what a space might be like if you don't have an opportunity. And that's one of the few times that I think that your virtual reality has a place within design and, and landscape architecture, because if we say we're going to move towards VR, AR, um, we're out of a job and the planet is doomed basically but if we can give people the opportunity to get a sense on one level of what an environment like might be like that may ease some of those concerns it won't give them the sensation of running their hands through the long grass it won't give them the sense of what's happening with all the the jasmine that's coming into flower that you're brushing past on your way into the orchard in the meadow but, but it, it may ease some of those concerns, but it's it's a very real issue that you raise that we need to be yeah. very careful in terms of how we approach, where we engage and giving those reassurances. Mm. So we have uh, we have quite a few questions for you. So right. I'm going to start with the first. I will go in the order in which they arrived. So from Yu Ching, um, hi Gail, my PhD is also about health and well-being, focusing on university setting. What I noticed is health can be overlooked in landscape design practice. So I'm wondering how do you think health can be introduced in landscape practice and how do we as health promoting landscape researchers fit into the process? So sorry, the, the point, the question she was asking was, how do we fit into the health process? And what was the other part to that question? Sorry. So I'm wondering, how do you think health can be introduced in landscape practice? And how can it be introduced? How do we? To landscape? Right. OK. Um, so in terms of introducing health into a landscape practice, it becomes just that, that lens that we approach everything. And so somebody might say they want a landscape that does this. And so we just give them that, but rather than having a monoculture for the same budget, we choose trees that are going to attract the birds in. We choose things that are going to fruit, flower, be fragrant. So it's just how we introduce it into our practice. It's us taking that opportunity, that responsibility to say, here's our opportunity, this is what we do. And so we've got to trust ourselves that we have the knowledge to be able to affect those changes and where we fit that in everywhere we go awesome thank you we have a question from um it's an anonymous person so so some 
some people will sign in as guests. Unfortunately, I can't tell their That's names, fine. but how important is movable seating in spaces compared to other elements? We, I don't have the data for that, but it seemed to be an important part of the effect that people had a sense of control. And that's something that we know from other health research um, outside of, of design, outside of, of landscape, that a sense of control is important to that sense of well-being. And so when your life is out of control, as it were, something as simple as being able to choose whether to pick up a bistro chair and move it into the sun or the shade, or choose to sit on a beanbag and move it over here with your friends, becomes an act of control. So yes, quite important. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Andreas. Thanks, Gail, for the inspiring presentation. Could you provide some details on how you measured well-being in your study? How did you distinguish between the influence of the garden and other influencing factors? Uh, interesting. So um, by having the randomized control trial, the control group went about life as, as usual. And so we tested everybody at the start of the study for their baseline data, and then everybody post-intervention. But only the two intervention groups actually had time in the plaza or the second intervention group time in the sensory garden. And so it was then very easy to be able to say, OK, um, by having a, a sufficiently powered, um, statistically powered sample size that we could draw out the, the significant um, data. We looked at con founders by way of saying, um, we measured nature relatedness, um, Nisbet et al's scale, is a really detailed 21 point scale that was going to tell us whether people who were tree huggers, people who were naturally inclined to be, have a greater affinity with green space, whether they were more likely to have a greater effect. And we found it had made no difference whatsoever. We also looked initially at whether people who had um, local visits to green space, to nearby nature, um, whether that had any influence on the outcomes of people in the study. And what we found was that rather than being a confounder, that in fact, um, when behaviour changed, so people who had been in the sensory garden group, they, their levels of physical activity um, increased. And so what had been measured initially just as a confounder became an outcome in and of itself when we found that um, there was a, a trend towards yeah, increased physical activity. So I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um, another question from an anonymous person. Uh, do you have good examples where councils set policies or standards to support health promoting spaces more, consist more consistently? Um, like, for example, implementing at scale throughout a neighborhood or city? Yes, Manchester and the UK are, are doing particularly well in terms of creating an overall sense of that health creating um, community. So, uh, yeah, they they are a group who are doing particularly well. Um, likewise, um, Paris's and Copenhagen are doing a lot in terms of their public space and how they are manipulating that space for for public health. Great, thank you. Um, a comment uh, from an anonymous person, not a question, but a comment. I uh, loved the talk, especially your focus on getting people, example, uh, the estate workers to experience the site and the process to understanding the effects. So um, yeah, um, I, I thank you again, uh, Gail. Um, uh, we don't have any more questions, but I wanna thank you for really sharing your research and your enthusiasm with us. It was really inspiring listening to you today. And we we got some really nice questions from, uh, from the public. So um, thank you all for listening and this will be recorded and you can find it on the SOLA uh, YouTube page, which you already have a link for in the invitation. So have all a very good day and see you again next week. Thanks, it was a pleasure. Bye-bye.